Good evening, church family. I know it might look a bit strange, but I am in my car this evening re recording my Bible study based on Romans because in the house it's a little bit noisy and I just thought this would be the best place to come and record it. So that's a bit odd. I hope you don't mind, but I think it's good for us to be here together. We've been reading through Romans and uh, this is a helpful um, slide from the Bible Project, which is a a YouTube uh, channel or a YouTube project that helps to look at uh, books of the Bible. And we've gone through verse, chapters 1 through 4, where we, uh, well, we haven't gone through chapters 1 through 4, but I've referred to those that just set up the context of the book of Romans. And then now we're busy with chapters 5 through 8, where we speak of the new humanity uh, that God creates. And that uh, chapter 5 began, therefore, we are justified by faith and spoke about the difference between life uh, in Adam and life under Christ, under Jesus. So because Jesus um, chose righteousness, that choice is more powerful than Adam's choice of sin. And so because of Jesus' choice of righteousness, love, faithfulness, and all that goodness of God enters into the world. In chapter 6, we speak about death, and it's compared to baptism. In baptism, remember, you might be submerged under the water, or that water expresses chaos and washing and rising up to new life and uh, to be joined to Jesus. But then in chapter 7, uh, if you imagine chapters 1 to 4 really set up the, the idea of Paul and uh, a Jew and a Gentile Christian discussing how can Gentiles and Jews both belong to the same kingdom of God, the same uh, uh, community, um, the argument starts to become about the law and why is there law? Shouldn't these new Christians who were Gentiles keep all the laws? And Paul wants them to know that through the Holy Spirit and Jesus, the law is fulfilled and people are set free to belong to God. But most important in all of this is the gift of God the Holy Spirit, which Romans chapter 8 starts to uh, help us to understand. And today we'll just go through Romans chapter 8, verse 1 to 12. Before we carry on, let's pray. Loving God, we thank you that we can study the scriptures, even though it's in this strange new way as we watch on YouTube and chat online. I pray, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit you would inspire us, inspire us with understanding and help us with a sense of community as we continue to love and worship you even during this difficult time. Today, Lord, we pray especially for those who are suffering from COVID-19. We pray especially for those who are caring for others and nurses and those who work on the front lines to keep us safe. And Lord, for those who are really struggling in terms of work and and life, I pray that you would provide for them so that they would be able to do all that they need to do in order to survive in these difficult times. Help each of us to be sensitive to each other's needs, to reach out to each other and help each other in difficulty. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've gone on to Romans chapter 8. Consequently, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And so in this uh, section, in this chapter, we're really going to be focusing on what that means. This phrase, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, and the law of sin and death, which is uh, speaking about the Old Testament law. Now, in chapter 7, Paul compared the two, uh, reminding us in that one very memorable image of the idea of a of someone who who was married but the the husband has died and so the marriage is absolved and so through death uh, Paul reminds us that this new life begins through Christ's death reminds us of of this new beginning that we can have under a new framework of law. Then we also talk about how the law exposes our sin. And I said, is this reverse psychology that the, the law exposes sin in us? And one of the examples of sin was the commandment that you should not covet. 
And Paul says in verse 11, For sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So this command not to covet is a command in the Old Testament that deals with our our inward desires, our inward heart. And by having that command, our sinfulness is exposed. Did what is good then bring death to me? By no means. Sin working death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. But this law that is a physical law, unlike the spirit, which is a spiritual law or spiritual life, um, does not set us free to become the people that we ought to be. And so Paul, uh, I always call this the dooby-doo, dooby-dooby-doo verse. If I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. And, and Paul, uh, Paul speaks here about the fact that he, he, in verse 19 of chapter 7, For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. So he speaks of us being kind of helpless as humans in the flesh who can't do what we need to do because sin in the flesh just overpowers us. And so we can also speak about how we cannot boast in our own righteousness because in the flesh we cannot keep the law. And so here's a new, a new dispensation that Paul wants us to understand. And that new dispensation is life in the Spirit. Now let's talk a bit about what that means, and we won't complete it all because we'll just uh, touch on it a little bit here, but we'll continue uh, next week too. So in an introduction in the um, in the uh, Faith Life Study Bible, in this chapter Paul presents God's solution to humanity's enslavement to sin, the Holy Spirit, who empowers believers to overcome the limitations of the flesh, and live in righteousness. Only the power of God's indwelling spirit can free the believer from the law of sin and death. So we've said now there is, oh, sorry, I'm going backwards. Uh, do, 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 do. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The Bible background commentary makes this comment. Paul's point here is that whether the law brings life or death depends on whether it is written in one's heart by the Spirit, following Ezekiel 36, 27, or practiced as an external standard of righteousness which is unattainable by human effort. And so this idea of law that is written in our heart by the Spirit that sets us free for new life is referred to in Ezekiel chapter 36. And the Jews of Paul's time and Jesus' time expected that this promise of Ezekiel would be fulfilled at the end of times when Messiah came. Now, Christians understood that this really meant now because we understand Jesus to be the Messiah. Ezekiel 36 verse 26, A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes. And be careful to observe my ordinances. And so this idea of a new heart that is given to the Christian is the idea of God's Holy Spirit softening our hardened hearts, making them soft and helping them to naturally follow his law, to write God's law on our hearts in the inward sanctuary of our being. And because of that, there is now no condemnation which refers to the penalty for sin, which would be separation from God. We cannot be separated from God because our hearts are changed and our inward being is changed. We remember that God doesn't judge the outward appearance, but the inward being. And in the Spirit, our hearts are changed and we become not just good in terms of our intentions, but good fundamentally because Christ has changed our hearts. We continue to be sanctified in this process, made holy, made to be more loving and kind and all of those things. But it is only through surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit that we become these things and not through our own effort. Christ gives us life.
to those who deserve death and freedom to those who are guilty under the law. We remember that we began with Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore, because we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And when I think of that, I just think of the necessi necessity of us surrendering ourselves to God, to allow God's Spirit to be the power by which we live, and not our own power. And this is the kind of thing that we're talking about when we talk about the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, as opposed to the law of sin and death. We have been transferred, in a sense, from being powered by the flesh to being powered by the Spirit. So if you imagine, uh, it's funny that I'm actually sitting in my car, which is just the quietest place I could find around the, around the house. Uh, this is a diesel car, which is lacquer, and my wife's car is a petrol car. And, uh, you know, it depends how you prefer it. I like diesel cars, so maybe I'll say the diesel car is the spirit-powered car and the petrol car is the flesh-powered car. So it's a different kind of fuel, a different kind of energy that drives you. Still a car, but different. And because uh, this is, I don't know what the rules are, let's just say that diesel was amazing fuel that didn't result in any pollution or anything like that, then you could say this is amazing. And so that's what the spirit is like, a new um, a new energy by which we are powered we live by the principle of the spirit of life in christ jesus rather than the principle of the law which is sin and death and so just thinking about that i also think a helpful image is the image on the right of man-made things which is the law of sin and death so to speak the the buildings and the things that people do in their own power or the life-giving tree the tree of life that is the gift of the spirit and so the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus sets us free and that's a principle that gives us life for what was impossible for the law which is this outward structure by which we are to live in the power of the flesh god is able to do for us by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now remember that Paul is referring now when he says by sending his own son to all that he's described in chapters 5, 6 and 7. By sending his own son, his son has come to make the choice that Adam, uh, to reverse the choice that Adam made. And so because his own son, Jesus, is more significant, more God and all those things than Adam, his choice of righteousness is more significant, more changing than than what Adam did. And so this new life is more powerful, more overwhelming, more everything than, than the choice to sin. So sinful flesh couldn't do what it needed to do, couldn't make us righteous, but Christ came and through his righteous decision condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law, now remember Ezekiel 36, the laws written on our hearts and we are changed might be uh, fulfilled, would be fulfilled in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So referring back to 5, 6 and 7 and all that Christ has done, we realize that the law is fulfilled in us because of what Christ has offered in offering himself. And then we carry on speaking about living according to this principle and plan, uh, those who are living according to the flesh are intent on the things of the flesh, but those who are living according to the Spirit are intent on the things of the Spirit. And uh, Eugene Peterson writes beautifully. He, he, he really takes into account the context and the, and the language and tries to put it into an idiom that we can understand in familiar language. Those who think they can do it on their own end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. Again, I'm talking about this idea of being Spirit-powered as opposed to being flesh-powered. This central fuel that gives us all of our energy and all of our life is God the Spirit. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's Spirit is in them, living and breathing God. It's for us to be 
mindful of surrendering ourselves to the Holy Spirit rather than to our own power. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious, free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. So again, that spirit life, the flesh life is is the works of the flesh from Galatians chapter 5, fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, compared to the spirit life, which is the power that God gives us, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what the spirit gives us. The mindset of the flesh leads to death, but spirit leads to life. And this language that speaks about mindset, I like this uh, interpretation. I think it's phronesis, phronesis, the psychological faculty of thoughtful planning, often with the implication of being wise and provident. So if your thoughtful planning is is all around things of the flesh, you you're just going to kill yourself. But if you do all of your thoughtful planning spirit-centered, then you will have life and life in all of its fullness. If you do all your thoughtful planning around your flesh, you will distance yourself from God and result in being an enemy of God. But if you live according to the Spirit, you will please God or make God happy. And so the New Revised Standard Version simply writes, You are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit. And some say, if you are in the Spirit. But uh, the New Revised Standard Version is quite, quite confident to say, if you are, through their translation, you are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. And uh, the Bible background, Bible New Bible Commentary, which is a lovely commentary, quite a large passages of scripture commentary but just puts things in simple ways that helps us to understand he says verse 9 makes clear that every person who belongs to christ has been transferred into this new domain in which the spirit rather than the flesh rules if you are in the spirit if you allow the spirit to rule in you if you have surrendered yourself to christ and let christ rule in you you are in the spirit and the spirit dwells in you Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And again, just a reminder that, that all you need to do to receive the Spirit of Christ is ask for the Holy Spirit. Jesus reminds us that, that whatever you ask in my name, I'll give you. And most importantly, He reminds us that if you ask for the Spirit, you'll receive it. And if you want to know if you've received the Holy Spirit, you don't have to speak in tongues or have any great, magnificent, charismatic experience, but rather just have that indwelling Spirit of Christ that starts to produce the fruit of the Spirit in you, making you more kind, more gentle, more, more peaceful. All of those fruit of, the Spirit's from Gal fruit of the Holy Spirit from Galatians chapter 5. Again from the message, a lovely phrasing of verses 9 to 11. But if God himself, this is just uh, verse 9 or so, but if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. This life of God in each of us that we are able to and encouraged to receive. Christ is in you. Though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And then this beautiful promise from verse 11. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through His Spirit that dwells in you. A reminder that all that we hope for in this life and in the life after this in Christ comes through the power of that same Spirit 
that rose Jesus from the dead on Easter Sunday. And if this Holy Spirit can take the dead body of Jesus, three days dead, in the tomb, and give it life and resurrection and power, how much more can this same Spirit give you in all your sin and all your brokenness and all your struggles life? He will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit that dwells in you. And just as a footnote, as I was finishing my preparations, I came across this other uh, few words from the New Bible Commentary. Just a, uh, commenting on verses 9 through 12 through 13. Here we are called by faithfulness to the Scriptures to hold in tension two clear truths. One, that the indwelling of the Spirit as the result of faith in Christ infallibly secures eternal life. So that's that that one truth, that one tension, that, that we allow the Holy Spirit, because of our faith in Christ, to give us eternal life. And then the second, that a lifestyle patterned after God's Spirit is necessary to inherit eternal life. So we hold these, these two things in tension. The one is a life that, that follows the Spirit, and the other is we cannot have that life that follows the Spirit without receiving the Spirit and we receive the Spirit without being who we who we ought to be just yet. And so we, we live in this kind of, this tension, holding these two things together. And the tension is softened somewhat by remembering that the Spirit given to us at conversion is Himself active to produce obedience. But it does not remove the tension, for we are still called upon to submit ourselves to this work of the Spirit. So we are saved by faith. Uh, by the Spirit who dwells in us through Christ as the Spirit sanctifies us because of our faith in Christ. But we also are called to live a life that is that follows the Spirit. And that's also necessary to inherit eternal life. But it is inevitable. If you have received the Spirit and you've put your faith in Christ, you will be transformed and you will start to live a life that, that more properly glorifies his name and our God. So I pray that that made sense to you as it has helped me to understand more of what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 and we're talking about how the Holy Spirit comes across in Romans and uh, I'll speak more about it next week. God bless and have a lovely evening. Loving God, thank you so much for the gift of your Holy Spirit who dwells in us. That same Spirit that raised Christ, that raised you, Christ, from the dead, dwells in us to give life to our mortal bodies, to transform us and renew us, set us free in you. Amen.